evening. This episode is the first in a series of which I cannot anticipate how many episodes there will be. That is, in how many episodes we can compress the history of Italy. And this for a simple reason. The volume, the volume of related information is immense. And, and furthermore, I would like this series of historical sketches to follow a slightly different format or criterion than those of standard history books. That is, as we proceed along the stream of time, we may linger more on some periods than on others, because, because like most history, the history of Italy is filled with interesting and or unusual characters, anecdotes, events that are well known, less known or mostly unknown. And choosing among them is a very arbitrary decision of him who undertakes the task of narration. We hope anyway that the viewers may get something out of the effort and I ask for indulgence, indulgence if in the selection we may disappoint some experts on the subject. It may surprise some if we say that, in this narrative anyway, that the history of Italy begins in China. Because, because in China there had been built an empire which, which much like the Roman Empire in the West and approximately at the same time had unified a good part of the Orient. Then, during its own decay, the Chinese Empire had been exposed to the same historical trap, trap that affected the Roman, namely the barbarians at its frontiers. The difference is that with Rome, the menace came from the east, whether in China it came from the west. Against this marauding and wild people roaming all the way from the river Don in Mongolia, in the vast land mass of Central Asia, the Chinese emperor had erected what they called the Great Wall, just as the Romans had put up what they called in Latin the limes, that is a network of frontier fortified military roads and structures. Typical of the limes is the well-known Hadrian Wall in England to protect the rest of England from the incursions of the Pitts, or if you like, the Scots. Today the Hadrian Wall is a renowned tract appealing to hearty, hearty walkers with a liking for ancient history. But walls and fortifications work well until there is an army to support them. And towards the end of the third century, the Great Wall of China could be compared to an obstacle, an obstacle in a racetrack for horses. The Mongol horsemen attacked it, and Chinese historians uh, call these Mongolians invader Yong Nu. They destroyed everything they found until they were repelled by another barbarians, other barbarians, whom the Chinese historians call Huan Huan. The Huan Huan gradually reunited China. The Yongnu, the barbarians number one, if you like, were nomad because they had no notions of agriculture. They had no other choice than attempting in the West what they had earlier done in the East. They had before them the immense, immense steppes, sparsely, sparsely inhabited by tribes of shepherds of mixed and possibly, possibly German ethnicity. These young Nu in Europe were called Huns, and in 395 AD, an officer of the Imperial Army stationed in the region called at the, in the region called at the time Thrace, and by the name and by the name this historia Amianus Marcellinus narrates of the terrifying apparition on the bank of the river Danube of certain men whom he describes as follows, small and stocky, beardless as eunuchs, and with horrible faces in which human traits are barely recognizable. Rather than men, they would appear to be beasts on two legs. They seem glued to their horses, they eat, drink, and sleep on their, on their mane, they run their business and take decision all, all on their horses. They even cook on them, because rather than cooking the meat they eat, they just warm it up, keeping it between their thigh and the body of the horse. This map shows the extent of the maximum area of land controlled by the Huns. The Huns, or Yongnu, did not, did not immediately threaten the empire. Their king, by the name of Rua, struck an agreement with the emperor of Constantinople, who, I mean the emperor, would allow him to settle in the region of Pannonia, that you see here, and give him every year a certain amount of gold. 
Rua was surprised, surprised that the emperor accepted. Surprised because he had learned of the power of the Roman Empire, but, and certainly it would not be the first time in history, not everything was as it seemed. The Roman Empire ranged all the way from Scotland to the Arabian Desert. The intensity of the commercial traffic benefited greatly from two crucial characteristics, a unique currency and the same citizenship this granted to all citizens of the empire by Emperor Caracalla. Four, four. Just as today the dollar is the currency of exchange, the exchange currency of the empire was the golden and silver denarius, which had the same credit from Portugal to Crimea. Local languages had gradually given way to Latin in the west and to Greek in the east. When, in 212 AD, Emperor Caracalla, as I said, extended full citizenship rights to almost all inhabitants of the empire, he had but recognized what in practice had already happened. At the beginning of the 4th century, Emperor Constantine introduced two critical reforms. One was the recognition of Christianity as the religion of the state. The other was the transfer of the capital from Rome to Byzantium, then renamed Constantinople. Most historians agree that the decision to adopt Christianity was a matter of expedience rather than faith. Pagans, especially in the West, were still largely and numerically superior to the Christians, but Christians gave a guarantee of unity which was critical for the political well-being of the empire. Otherwise, otherwise, Constantine, as a character, was cruel. He killed enemies, he killed friends, even relatives, when he felt it was appropriate. And, incidentally, he converted to Christianity only on point of death. Not all the pagans were happy. There was an effort by Julian the Apostate or the Apostate to restore the antique faith. But the pagans were also skeptics. And skepticism, you may agree, is not a solid base for building a sense of unity. Furthermore, furthermore, for a long time the empire had become if you like, an autocracy tempered by the right of murder, to, mur to murder the emperor, that is. Usually, it was a general who, at the head of his troops, attempted the coup a coup d'etat. If he succeeded, he was acclaimed and revered. If he failed, he was killed. Much as recently happened in Ukraine a few years back, in that instance, as you no doubt know, to be killed were policemen and citizens who were shot at by the revolutionaries themselves. But in the past, for the equivalent of a Poroshenko, the current president of Ukraine, the safety of the old or the new ruler was not guaranteed. Also, also, the transfer of the capital of the empire to Constantinople placed the court closer to the oriental satrapies. Ideas spread sometimes in invisible ways, and the nearness of oriental culture, if you like, further accelerated the evolution of the general system into despotism. The echo of the intricate waves of influences and corruption has left a trace in the language with the adjective Byzantine or the word Byzantinism. And 2000 years later we can see echoes of the oriental satrapies and of their mode of operation in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where, for example, an inconvenient journalist or dissenter can easily dispatch and his body sectioned into pieces during a visit to a foreign consulate. Concomitant with this evolution in the position of the emperor and with the transfer of the capital from Rome to Constantinople, two important changes also occurred. The finances of the empire became essentially the personal finances of the emperor, and he, I mean the emperor, ever more ab absorbed with immense bureaucratic in, in, in absorbing the immense bureaucratic tasks, became, he became himself a bureaucrat. He lost contact with reality and, above all, with the army, located at immense and immensely distant borders. The armies were under the direct control of generals, whose return to the capital was dangerous, for they could remove the current emperor and take his place. The natural frontiers of the Roman Empire were marked by three rivers, the Euphrates, the Danube, and the Rhine. 
And when it was strategically necessary to cross these rivers to annex some land beyond the rivers, the Romans built the limes, that is, a fortified border, the conceptual equivalent, if you like, of the Wall of China. Here, for example, is the limes germanicus, the German border. In time, the limes changed structure. Behind them, they were located, in the heyday of the empire, temporary camping sites. These temporary camping sites transformed themselves into villages, military villages, that is. Further back was stationed the bulk of the various armies, ready to move to the point of the limes, or the fr of the frontier, under threat of invasion. When Rome decided that the expansion of the empire had reached its limits, these fortified military villages were gradually transformed into small towns, and the small towns into burgs, which is an old German term for a fortress. An ending found, for example, in cities such as Pittsburgh, Strasbourg, Hamburg, and all the many towns and cities in Europe that have a burg or a burg incorporated into their name. The birth and growth of the burgs or burgs were both an evolution, meaning a change from the original military camp, and as well as a symptom, because, because a people rendered conservative by overall favorable conditions and rendered sedentary by civilization begins to think and dream of security. To attain security while not being able any longer to rely on, on military virtues, the empire and its people then rely on technology. In the instance, as the limes, the walls, no longer constituted a good defense against invasion from the outside, behind the limes, behind the frontiers, cities began to build their own independent limes. They became fortified cities. During this period, the most sought-after skill was architecture, you can imagine. Emperor Gallienus favored, for example, and amply remunerated to architects, Cleodamus and Ateneus, who built the defense walls of the most threatened cities along the river Danube. In Italy, an example of a city fortified at the time of the empire is Verona, and here are some of the remnants of the original Roman walls, which were then enlarged and extended during the Middle Ages. This, the encirclement of cities by defensive walls, was one of critical changes in the structure of the empire. Another had to do with the organization of the military. By the time of Constantine, the army was constituted almost exclusively of barbarians, and furthermore, the habit, the habit and customs of the barbarians were quite different from the habits in the Roman army of old. The idea of a homeland, of a state, of an empire left them, the barbarians, quite indifferent. They had the, the, typical, the typical characters of the mercenary and considered themselves as part of the personal militia of their general which makes sense. Furthermore, many of the barbarian generals didn't even speak Latin. They dressed in barbarian fashion, legs covered with skins and wearing a kind of helmet with horns on their heads. They were Roman citizens, thanks to the Emperor Caracalla, but for barbarian soldiers and generals, their advancement, advancement in the Roman world was limited to a military career. And already in the third century, they had essentially monopolized just about all staffing and opportunities in the Roman military. Therefore, the so-called barbaric invasions, rather than an external, were an internal phenomenon and were carried out through the army and the military. Consequently, consequently, the army assigned to defend the Iron Curtain of the time, if you will, was, will, was essentially made up by the same people who lived inside and outside the curtain. Typically, generals welcomed in the army those who wanted to join from the other side of the curtain, and in time some of the barbarian tribes converted themselves to agriculture and settled, for example, in Gallia, that is, into what is today France, where the imperial authorities gave them lands to, to cultivate. Some historians have seen in this large, in this, in this evolution, a large plan by Rome to absorb and civilize the barbarians. The point is that the emperors could not do otherwise. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this policy had the advantage too of legitimizing the inevitable, 
were leaving intact, at least formally, the imperial authority, apart from the occasional rebellions. The web of early Italian history was, needless to say, very complicated. And complicated not only by the evolution of the imperial Roman structure and by the incorporation of the barbarians into the military. Another seemingly less important and yet crucial element of the complication had to do, had to do with religion. Emperor Constantine had indeed made Christianity the official religion of the empire. However, that was not, that was not the end of the story. Early Christianity had many sects and subsects, each one offering a different interpretation of the Christian religion or message. With gross oversimplification, a sect, or rather the interpretation of Christianity that most affected the political, the social, and the religi religious world, world of the time was Arianism, whose name derives from its founder and preacher called Arian. Again, with massive oversimplification, the dispute had to do with the interpretation of the divinity of Christ, one of which, the one that prevailed, and it is at the core even of current Christianity, was called Trinitarian or Trinitarianism. It holds that God is one God, but with three co-eternal, consubstantial persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The three persons are distinct, yet they constitute one substance, essence, or nature. And as an aside, to express the original idea of a trinity of forces shaping the cosmos was actually Plato, who, I mean Plato, struggled with the idea of how a being purely incorporeal could execute the perfect model of the universe and mold with his hand what was but a rude and independent chaos. In an effort to come up with an explanation, or at least a theory, Plato considered the divine nature of the universe under three modifications. The first cause was the reason, or logos, the soul of the universe. And many of you will no doubt recall the words, in the beginning was the word, which is an imperfect, imperfect translation of logos, which indeed, logos, that is, has also means word, but not in the usual sense that we attribute to it. A better translation would be, in the beginning was the reason of the universe. Anyway, Plato conceived of three original principles incorporated into the Logos, different but united with each other by a mysterious generation. All this is to say that the mysterious concept of the Trinity is, or was, the Christian answer, if you like, to an idea of Plato, and you can see the correspondence in this illustration. The Trinity may still remain a mysterious idea, but at least the mind can better understand a Father, a Son, and the Holy Ghost than Plato's philosophical rendering. The Arians, instead, did not understand nor accept the idea of Trinitarianism. Christ was not an eternal figure, but came after the Father. And it may be almost impossible for us to believe it, but the controversy was centered on whether the three persons of the Trinity were, using the Greek word, homo homoousius, meaning equal, or homoousius, meaning similar. Thousands died for the difference of a vowel. For a the how a theological distinction could be the source of bitter wrangling, jealousy, animosity, vengeance, and mutual acrimonies, accusations, and so forth may seem incomprehensible to us. The nearest equivalent that comes to mind, not, not, in, not in concept but in global effect, is the ideological difference that separates communism from capitalism, or if you like, globalism versus nationalism. The dispute between Arianism and Christianity was the main reason. The main reason behind the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD in what is today Turkey. There were actually two councils of Nicaea without any conclusion. And it was only after the Council of Constantinople, held during the reign of Emperor Theodosius in 378 AD, that the dispute was resolved and the Nicaean Creed, as it was called, was officially adopted and Arianism was declared a heresy. Now back to the barbarians. They did not constitute a unity. They belonged to 
different strains of mostly northern and northeastern European extraction. To talk about them all will be would last will last out a night in Russia when nights are longest there, as Shakespeare would say. Together, however, they played a part in the disintegration of the Western Roman Empire before some of them emerged in different ways as the new rulers of Western Europe and founders, founders of the Western Roman Empire about 400 years later in 800 AD with Charlemagne. That is, the Western Roman Empire reinvented 400 years after its collapse of the original Roman Empire, believe it or not, lasted until the First World War of 1914-1918 when the Emperor of Austria and Hungary, the last survivor of a long line of emperors dating, dating back 1300 years, left the throne. As you can see, there is more continuity in history than would appear at first glance. The impression of this continuity at times occurs when we look at separately at different historic events, each on their own. These barbarians were pushed west by the arrival, as I said at the beginning, of the Huns, of the Yongnu. And this set of affairs, meaning the soft incorporation of the Germans and other barbarians into the Roman system, may have continued on the, on the whole, we can say peacefully, if and only if the Huns had remained in China after breaking through the walls of China, as we talked earlier on. But this did not happen and their arrival in Europe turned everything upside down, giving rise to the destructive, the feverish, the tumultuous, barbaric, biblical flood inside the Limes, which were, as I said, the equivalent of the Wall of China, only in, in Europe. One tribe of barbarians, if we wish to continue to use this term, were the Goths. In fact, the main barbarian people who most influenced the history of Italy were, in their order of time, the Goths, the Longobards and the Franks. With additional contribution and influence from two strain of different or different tribes, the Normans, who ended up expanding into England with William the Conqueror, and of course the Arabs, who occupied and greatly influenced the development and civilization of southern Italy. In what time is left here in this episode, I will deal with the Goths, for it was one of their king, the legendary Alaric, Alaric who eventually, by sacking Rome at the beginning of the 5th century, put an official end to what went down in history as the Roman Empire. The Goths came from what is today Sweden, and one of whose provinces, Gothland, is still carries the name, and they gradually migrated from the original land, first to Prussia and northeast Germany, and from there they arrived at their temporary destination on the northern shore of the Black Sea. Their relationship with the Romans varied with time. Some Goths joined the Roman army, and the first clash with the Romans happened during the Empire of Decius, who with a strong army penetrated in what today is a Serbia and fought with them at a location called Philippopolis that the Goths had earlier conquered. The next Roman emperor, Aurelian, granted to them the land, the land called Dacia or Dacia, which today corresponds roughly to Hungary and Romania. And during a period of 100 years of relative tranquility, the Goths acquired two instruments that are fundamental to a civilization, a written language and a religion. The man who achieved this objective was called Ulfila. It was, the, it was he, Ulfila, who invented the characters, today we would call them fonts, the Gothic font, which is as beautiful to look at as it is difficult to read. And Ulfila also translated into this new written language both the Bible and the New Testament. Some of you may ask if the magnificent Gothic cathedrals have anything to do with the Goths. The answer is no, for the so-called Gothic cathedrals came out much later, and the most fundamental element of the Gothic style in their, or style of architecture is the pointed arc, pointed arch, which was likely borrowed by the, from the Islamic architecture that would have been seen in Spain at the time. The Goths were Aryans, an issue that will have consequences in the history of Italy until Aryanism was eradicated. But Aryanism at this point was not critical. Critical, however, as I said, was the arrival of the Huns. And this is how Jordanus, the historian of the Goths, describes them. 
When King Philemer led our people into Scythia, Scythia, near the Black Sea, he found in the middle of the population of the place certain witches which he drove away because of their magic evil doings. These witches lost themselves in the desert where they met with the spirits of evil who lived in those surroundings. The spirits of evil took the witches as concubines and from their union the Huns were born yellowish creatures full of hatred, small, fierce, and even incapable to articulate their thoughts. In the next episode we will see how the Huns disrupted the peaceful cohabitation of the Goths inside the Roman Empire, how eventually Rome fell and the immediate aftermath after the fall. After the fall. Until then, I am Jimmy Molia for Historica Sketches. Good night. Mm-hmm.